Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, the ups and downs and how to navigate life with kids on your own while keeping sane. Covering subjects such as domestic violence through to fussy eaters and solo dating. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. This week's guest is a mother of twin girls born in 2019 and a stepmother of two other children. She has eight plus years of clinical and community social work and has a strong mental health background, a bachelor's degree in social work and is a trained behavioral health consultant working with patients aged zero to 100 on symptom reduction, achieving success in both their mental and physical health. 2020 was her hardest year to date. She suffered from PPD and PPA shortly after the emergency birth of her daughters and a week-long NICU stay. She used the same tools that she used uses with her patients to pull herself through the darkest time of her life while exercising healthy boundaries, severing toxic ties and prioritizing herself and her mental health. Today, she supports mothers on their journeys, telling them that it's me first, me second, and me third. Wow. Welcome, Megan. Thank you for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. 2020 for you, like it was a tough year for everyone, um, what with COVID appearing and stuff like that. But like it, it yeah. was an even tougher year for you, like you had COVID and then PPD and PPA mm-hmm. and that's post-traumatic or post-part. Oh God, here we go. I've got to get it right. Maybe it's better if you say what PPD and PPA is. It's because uh, I can't pronounce it. It's, it's post. Yeah, it's postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. There we go. You said it so much better than me. <laughs> so you had those. So look, tell us a little bit about what happened and like yeah, how yeah. you how you got them. And, and also, let's t- tell us a little bit about how you got there first, okay. and then we'll go into a bit more detail about what they actually are and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I gave birth to twin girls in October of 2019. So just at the end of 2019 and they came via emergency C-section. So not the, not the birth that I was planning on having, but that's how they came. They were born uh, five weeks premature. So they had a NICU stay as well. And so when they were and so that born, was a, that was a week, was that a week's NICU yeah. stay? Yeah, they stayed in the NICU for a week. Um, And so when they arrived, you know, it was like an emergency birth. So I didn't get to see them. I didn't know what they looked like. They were just kind of taken out of me and whisked away. And then I was, you know, I was left alone. Like when you have twins, you have so many different teams of doctors. So the operating room was like so loud. It was like I was at a concert and they even had music playing in there too. It was so loud. And then suddenly it went completely quiet. And I was left alone and the girls were taken away. Oh my! And so that was really hard to deal with at first. Like, are are they okay? Where are they going? What do they look like? Right. And then, well, yeah. Cause I, like I had a C-section with my son and it was like, like we'd been in, well, it wasn't really labor, but it felt like it. We'd been in labor all day. Mm -hmm. I had a Mm C-section with him and I know exactly what you mean. Like they, they wheel him away, like he was yeah. wheeled away. And admittedly, I didn't go for as long as you did, but like you're left to recover, aren't you? And that's basically what they were doing is leaving mm-hmm. you in the recovery room to recover after the operation and make sure you're okay and that nothing really happens to you. And then they take the girls off or they took my son off. And, you know, he mm-hmm. wasn't, he had, had problems breathing and bits and pieces like that. So they had to check him out. But it, you are sort of left a little bit like, where's my baby? Is he all right? Like what just happened? Yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so... Of course, my, you know, my husband went with the girls, which is where I wanted him to be, but I was just kind of stunned because everything had happened so fast. You know, I wasn't expecting them to come that day. I had just gone for like a routine scan and there was some issues with blood flow. So it was like, okay, they're coming oh, like now. Wow. So this was all very out of the, out of the blue for so me. So how far gone were you though? Um, so like 38 weeks, like t- I w- 35, 35. Weeks. Okay. So it was a little bit of a shock because yeah. you were thinking you had another month to go really. Yeah. Yeah. And I had had a really healthy pregnancy up until that, even though it was high risk being twins, I was really lucky that I had been healthy. So it was very shocking to me. And I'm someone that plans every aspect (laughs) of my life. So 
when the doctor told me that my mom was with me and I looked at my mom and I said, well, I had plans today. <laughs> my mom's like, are you registering what they're saying to you? Like the babies are coming today, Megan. <laughs> like, well, I have to do this and I have to do this. She's like, no, we're not doing those things oh anymore. God. We have to go to the hospital. So I was wow. in shock. Right. And I never got over that shock even through the birth. And for some reason, my epidural took a really long time to come out. So I, because I couldn't stand up for a long time, I didn't even get to see my twins until well over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So I never got skin to skin. You know, I didn't know what they looked like. And not a lot of people were coming to kind of check in with me because they were concerned with the girls, which I'm thankful for, but it's still very concerning for a new mother to not have kind of that contact and information as to what's and going were, on. And they were your first children as such, weren't they? Yeah, they were, yeah, yeah, so, they were, yeah, so, they were. so it's not as though you're, you've, you know, these are like the second, the second children um, or, you know, and you'd mm -hmm. had one previously. So, you know, you sort of knew uh, in a way it sort of takes that newness away. Like, you know, when it's his second child, you sort of know what happens. It's sort of a bit blase about it and stuff like that. It says me who's only had one child. But, you know, I know from friends that have had a couple that, you know, it's like, oh, here we go. Yeah. I've... Whereas when it's the first one, you just, everything's new. You don't know. Is this supposed to happen? Yeah. I don't yeah, know anything. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. And so I could feel myself starting to kind of slip. <gasps> like I could, like, as I call it right away. Oh like my I gosh. Was like, that early. You know, anxious anxious right yeah. away but I kept telling myself like okay well you know what just happened was obviously very stressful and it was even though it was a c-section it was a bit of a rough c-section <laughs> like because my one daughter was tucked way up under my ribs and I'm I'm tall so the doctor came over to my face and said so it's gonna feel like someone's sitting on your chest and that's because I'm gonna sit on your chest I'm like, well, okay. Cause that's how hard they had to push to get her down and out. So I was in a lot of pain and had, yeah, no contact with my kids and didn't know what was happening. And so my mood was starting to slip, right? I'm like, what is happening here? This is not what I envisioned or wanted. And then going back and forth to the hospital to visit them, like leaving the hospital without your children is a really, really hard thing. I can imagine. Yeah, 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 definitely. Because mm -hmm. you're expecting to leave with them, like put them in their little car seats and live with them. Yeah. And like how soon after you having the C-section did you leave hospital? Uh, two days later. Wow. Really? See, I had a whole five days in hospital. Yeah, no, they were trying to kick me out the day after. Wow. And I was saying then, like, no, I, I can't go home. Like, I'm in so much pain. I could hardly go to the washroom by myself. And they were just like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I said, no, like this was a double C-section. Like, there was two of them coming out. Right? Yeah. Like you two babies come out of me, ripped out of me. Oh my God. <laughs> And I was like, I'm not okay. And my kids are in the NICU and I just need like a minute to kind of register what's happening here. So I felt like they kind of took pity on me and let me stay an extra night. But then they were like, okay, like this is protocol. Like you're going to go home. And once I came home to my empty house and my kids weren't there, I just really started to, to spiral. Like I really felt my mood. Wow, slip. really? So, in, okay. So in what way, mm -hmm. what was happening to you that was making you feel that things were starting to slip? My anxiety, like the way it felt in my body was just unbearable. Like the tightness that I felt in my chest, that overwhelming feeling of panic, I knew was not normal. And I knew that it was more than just like the baby blues, like they call it, because I just know myself and I know my body and the fears that I was having around the girls being in the NICU and me not being there were completely irrational. And even I could look at myself, you know, kind of from outside and say like, oh, okay, Megan, like those thought processes are not okay. They're taken care of. The nurses are there. My husband spoke so well of the nurses. He said they were amazing, but it didn't matter to me. Like it was irrational yeah. to me. Nobody was going to feed them. Nobody was going to take care of them. I was like hyper fixated on their feeding schedule, their changing schedule. Uh, one of my daughters was on CPAP. So that was something I was really fixated on. And so with my what CPAP, Oh, sorry. sorry. Was CPAP? She was on like a breathing apparatus. So she had, oh, like a, wow. yeah. Cause her okay. lungs were a bit underdeveloped. Yeah. And so with my educational background, I knew that those types of intrusive thoughts, like were not normal. And I was telling 
everybody that like, I, because I wanted to advocate for myself. So I was telling every physician that I saw, every nurse that I saw, any health care that I saw, like, Hey, this is what's going on for me. This is not normal. I do not act this way. I am not an anxious person. And they're like, Oh no, it's, it's normal. It's just the baby blues. You'll be fine. Wow. And I just got worse and worse and worse. And Okay. So, so let's, let's just explain, right? So PPD and PP, PPA are like, not the baby blues, right? Mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. is, this is like what they would class as clinical yeah. postpartum depression postpartum yeah. anxiety this isn't like where you're just you're just feeling a little bit anxious because you haven't got the kids at home this is like full on a different level mm-hmm. yeah and so to have the baby blues after birth is very normal for women because we go through a huge hormonal shift right so to be like crying and weeping and all that is very normal I- plus <laughs> plus you're sleep deprived and so that is I, know, I can remember standing like my parents because I, I I live in Australia obviously and um my parents come from the UK and um, my parents flew in. They were supposed to fly in the week before I had Oscar and I had him a week early. So they basically flew in. I had to get a friend to get them from the airport. They turned up with me, said, stood in the kitchen, leaning on the kitchen worktop in labor. And my oh mum's like, gosh. okay, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. But I ain't going until these are really close together. Cause I've gone through like 48 hours of like labor pains or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like the first day hadn't really happened. And I remember like standing over my poor son who, and I'm going to my mum, I've just had a baby and bursting into tears, right? And she going, I know you have. And he's like sitting there squirming, (laughs) stinking like a stinky monster. And I'm going, wow, it's a baby. And like all of those sort of things, but you know, and then going, why is this child crying when Mm. I'm changing his nappy? I'm doing something to help him. So there was things like that going, but like nothing to the level, like at, at its worst, how bad was the PPD and PPA for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I would say the postpartum anxiety was worse for me in terms of I had oh, a, con- okay. a constant sense of panic, like a constant sense of I can't breathe. I'm hyperventilating. And it got so bad for me that I was walking. So it was winter now. It was like December. And I was walking in my diaper because I was still bleeding at that time, which again is not normal to bleed for that long. I was still like hemorrhaging at that time. And I was walking to the park and I was crossing the road and I saw a truck coming and I thought, I just would like that truck to hit me. (gasps) Like I really, not because I wanted to die necessarily, but because I just just wanted wanted to to stop. I just wanted to stop because I couldn't take that feeling that that sense of panic all All the time. time. Like I just wanted to rip my skin off all the time. And I've never experienced anything like that in my life. And I just couldn't get a hold on it. It's, it's hard to explain, but when you feel so out of control, you just want to crawl out of your skin. Yeah. Wow. And, and Mm -hmm. okay. And so how long did this go on for before you sort of went, okay, like there's something not quite right here. I need to, well, I mean, it sounds to me like you were saying there's something not quite right with me from the word go. Oh, absolutely. But then did you go and get help or did everyone go, no, you'll be okay. And you had to actually take control of the situation yourself. Yeah. So I, so this lasted for a year before I finally started to like make some progress and get better. But I was like actively asking for help because in Canada, we have nurses that come to the house and check on you. And then, you know, you take your babies for their first immunizations. And again, they do a screen with you. So every time I was like brutally honest to the point where some people didn't know what to say to me, like I was telling them, like, I think of walking into traffic I go for drives on the highway and think of driving into the river and they were like ah it's just the baby blues like you'll be fine oh my god and so it's not not at that stage like and even when I went for my six-week postpartum checkup with my OB again I said like I am not okay I can't stop crying and I was even crying in her office and again she was like you're fine. You know, you have twins. This is normal. It's overwhelming. I'm like, this is not normal. But at that point I just couldn't fight anymore. I felt so defeated because it already is kind of out of character for me to, to ask for help. I've always been someone that can just handle anything that comes my way. And I very clearly was not handling this. 
But after that six week checkup, I just thought like, okay, I guess I just need to pull it together. And so my anxiety turned into almost like OCD. So then again, when people would come to my house on the outside, I looked perfect. I had lost all the baby weight plus some because I was never eating. My house was immaculate because if my girls slept, which they never slept, but if they slept, I was washing baseboards. Like my, I have a big house and it was like immaculate. So if my friends came over, they were like, oh my God, you're super mom. When really I was a shell of a person that was just channeling my anxiety into controlling every aspect of my home and of the girls. I even had a whiteboard where I was, you know, writing their feedings down, writing their diaper changes down. I controlled everything and that's not normal either. But that was the only way that I could find control in like a tornado wow. is what it and felt so, like. Okay. So everything was feeling so out of control that that was how you were controlling was documenting it down and stuff like that, which which, which to a certain mm-hmm. extent I can understand because it's that way of actually compartmentalizing it as such, isn't it, really? So. I think it made me feel in control. Yeah. Wow. Cause, cause it's so out of control with kids and you had twins. So that would be yeah. over like, it was bad enough. Like I felt t- at times overwhelmed with just one child who just didn't sleep. So you had two mm-hmm. that weren't sleeping and then all of the other stuff that was going on was just, yeah, would just yeah. be unbelievable. Yeah. And so, I, so, okay. So, so what did you do? So that went on for a year. And then right when I was coming up to the girl's first birthday, I was just kind of reflecting on the year because it, it on one hand, like flew by, but then on the other hand felt painfully slow. But when I reflected on it, I just didn't have any joy. Like when I reflected on the year, Mm. I was so sad by all the moments that I felt were stolen from me, all the expectations that I had hoped for that didn't happen because then in February, COVID rolled around. So um, where I live, you know, I don't have any family here. My family is 12 hours away. And so I- Yeah, similar to me. Yeah, and so when I was going to have the girls, I thought, well, like, at least I have a really awesome friend group. And I do, but then COVID rolled around. So of course, everybody was wanting to stay away. And so- my, even now my friends like hardly even know my daughters just because of the way things have been. And that was so sad for me to reflect on the first year of my daughter's lives. I'd always, always wanted to be a mom. I was like the happiest pregnant, pregnant person, but the first year of their lives was complete torture. Yeah, I was like, this just, just has to stop. Like I have to find the strength to ask for help again. And so I, researched some psychologists in my area and reached out to one that specialized in postpartum depression and anxiety and like strictly worked with women so that I felt I would at least be taken seriously by somebody that specializes in it because nobody else was taking me seriously. Yeah. And so I started, um, you know, going to counseling because the first step of that was really like grieving. I had to grieve this whole kind of life and experience that I thought I was going to have and I didn't get it. Wow. Oh, so, okay. So you had expected the first year with your child, children. Did you know you were going to have twins? I suppose you would have done when you had the scans. Yeah. I did. Yeah. 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 I knew I was Because it would have been like, surprise. Yeah. No. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I knew I was going to have twins, but again, I was like probably naively optimistic. I had everything done like well in advance to their birth. And because I had always wanted to be a mom, like I was elated. I was that like stereotypical glowing pregnant person. I was just so thrilled to be pregnant. And I was so excited to be on maternity leave. I was like, this is my time. Like I've been waiting for this. This is going to be the best year of my life. I never thought that I would have anxiety or depression because I've never had mental health issues. And so this just like completely came out of the blue and like tore me apart. I mean, I've never broken that much in my life. And like, how would you deal with, and like you said, like, like you said earlier, you'd never had mental health issues per se previously right so Mm -hmm. how would you deal with stressful um or um anxious inducing for want of a better word situations how would you normally have dealt with it 
Yeah. I mean, I had never had anything that anxiety inducing, but I mean, prior to, prior to that, I lost my dad in 2014, which is, you know, oh, traumatic wow. and, and yeah. unfortunate. And, but I, I had a lot of time to pour into myself. Right. I mean, I was able to exercise. I was able to do things that brought me joy. I was able to see friends and all of that was removed was all from the positive me. sort of yeah, stuff. And, yeah. Um, added on to my twin girls. I also have two stepsons. So when I wasn't dealing with my twin yes. girls, you know, I had the boys here and my husband was, you know, still having to keep up with their, their life and their activities and shuffling them to and from yeah. sports. And so I had a lot of time alone with newborn premature twin girls. So there, there was no oh time gosh. for me to eat or shower or in my mind, at least I thought there wasn't because of course there was, but I couldn't, I could not, there was no napping when the baby napped. I was so anxious that I would just stare at the monitor or stare at them directly and wait for them to wake up. I went 52 oh hours gosh. one time without okay. sleeping and my mom actually was staying with me. So my mom was staying with me and I still was not sleeping because I didn't trust her to watch my own children, even though I have like the best mother in the world the best but it's no reflection on your mom it's the fact that your anxiety was just such yeah, a level it was, it was so bad but I was so sleep deprived that I came out of the nursery and I said to my mom I think I'm having a psychotic break because the walls were breathing with me in the nursery like I was like oh my hallucinating God. and my mom was like no Megan you just need to go to bed we've been asking you to go to bed for days and you won't but nobody could rationalize with me. Like there was, yeah. if my mom tried or my husband tried, I would just bite their head off. Right. So they were like, okay. So did they try and talk to people and get you help and stuff like that as well? Um, like they never made phone calls without okay. me, but I, but I remember when the nurse came to my house, you know, my mom speaking up and saying like, yeah, this is not Megan. Like she needs help. And I was there too. Like I heard her say it. And the nurse was like, okay, well, you know, maybe you should check in with your OB. But then I did. And of course I was brushed off. And I remember my husband very delicately dancing around it at my girl's first immunizations. Cause he was like, oh God, is she going to rip my head off if I say yeah. this? So they did do a, like a screen with me they made me answer some questions. And of course, like I checked all the boxes for depression, but then that was the end of it. They were like, yeah, so you have depression. I was like, yeah, no shit. Like, I'm very aware of that. Like, <laughs> but but I, can you do with it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like, I, I am aware of that. I've been saying that for months. Wow. But because she wasn't offering up any help, it was just sort of like another person. Yeah, it was like a ticket. Of... Yeah, it was like, oh, you've ticked the box of depression, but like, we can't yeah. give you anything. It's like, what are you going to do yeah. with that? You need to now go away and, you know, like, do something with it. Because, uh, you know, as government body or whatever, like, we can't do it. And, mm -hmm. and it's, yeah, it's it's just bizarre so okay it's just a very broken system yeah it, it, like, and you know like i think it's an overloaded system i can't speak for the canadian system but i i know from australia's perspective it's an overloaded system but i think mm -hmm. it's an inefficient overloaded system i think there's a lot of efficiencies that could be put in place that get lost in it being a government yeah. system so there's a lot of things that if it was a business um, you know, corporate sort of perspective would run a lot more efficiently and there would be, you know, there would be a lot of chafe being like, you know, knocked out the door, but saying that they do do an awesome job. Like mm -hmm. I can't like, it's a yin and a yang because, you know, you want to like make it more efficient, but they do do an awesome job. Everything, everyone who does that job does an awesome job, but it's just like, guys, we need to think about this differently, like schools and like mm -hmm. child support and various different other things that I could go into, but I'm not going to here because um, that's a whole podcast on its own. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So you then went and sought help yourself yeah. and went to a psychologist, but like, so, mm -hmm. but, but like you're, Mm -hmm. you're a social worker you've done like you've got a mental health background you've done you've got all of this so like yeah yeah I mean you know and yeah. and like and and it's not so it basically means that this can happen to anyone you know I mean you you knew you know in a way you were sitting there on a wall watching yourself yeah. going like well I know there's something up with me because this I know this is not supposed to happen and I know these thought processes mm -hmm. and stuff like that so like what did you how did you work through this and yeah. and and what strategies did you put in place to actually break the, because it's almost like breaking that mind. Yeah. 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 Frame, so, isn't it? Uh, oh, totally. Like shaking and it up. 
with anybody, whether they have like postpartum depression or just depression or anxiety, like you have to start off really slow because those things that used to feel good for us, like all that self-care stuff doesn't feel good anymore, especially when you're anxious, because what I needed more than anything was a break and it was time to rest and eat and sleep. But taking that time away from my kids when I'm anxious did not feel good. Right. Like, so I had, yeah, I know, it did, it did for the, for, a, for the like a little bit. Right. So I had to start really slow where it was like, okay, I got to pick the time, right. When I wanted to be away from them. So at first I couldn't be away from them until they were in bed. So I knew that I had fed them, changed them. They were good. Now I could step oh, away and, stay and I just started and by going for I didn't start sleeping right away because that was hard for me, but I just started going for drives because I had nowhere to go because it was COVID. So everything was closed. And so all I could do yeah. was go for a drive. And I love music. So that was relaxing for me. We have kind of a loop that goes all around the city. So I'd get on the highway and drive the loop, which takes about an hour and just listen to music. Wow. And 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 obviously, so I did that a obviously lot. you hadn't left the girls at home on their own. Like hubby was there or whatever. Ever. And like, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah wow. Yeah. And so I would do that, you know, once a week, then I would once start a week. It twice a week. Then honestly, but then honestly, for a while, it was like, that was my routine every single evening, every single evening I went for a drive and then it just got progressively easier and better. And then I would incorporate something else. And then I started working on just like basics that people slow, forget, you know, slow like steps. Yeah. And I, I didn't get to a point right away where I could incorporate things like, you know, friends and working out because that was like far-fetched. I had to go right back to basics and be like, okay, so my goal today is that I'm going to shower before 4 PM and I'm going to make sure that I actually eat breakfast today. Wow. Right. Like, because that, I wouldn't do that. And I remember I wouldn't even allow myself to go to the bathroom. Like I would literally be having bladder cramps because I had not peed all day because I couldn't take my eyes off my kids. So I had to tell myself like, okay, Megan, you have to go to the bathroom. Oh my God. And there was me. <laughs> I would be going to the bathroom just to get a break. <laughs> I would go to the bathroom and put him outside so I could obviously see him. But like, yeah. And then I would just like, yeah, just to get a break and like, go, oh, yeah, this is good. I used to love because I breastfed yeah. him. And so I used to love breastfeeding him mm-hmm. because it in the afternoon, I would, and you like, you had twin girls, right? Like I had one kid, so I could like swap him over. Right. So it wasn't too bad, but like you've got (laughs) girls, right? So like twin girls. So yeah, I mean, I, the logistics of twin girls must've just been like a whole different, it was nuts. Yeah. Like a whole different ball game. Cause once I was done with one, like the other one needed me. Right. And my one daughter had colic. And so it took like over an hour and a half just to feed her. So by the time I was done feeding Ava, Madison was hungry oh my again. God. And you're just <laughs> like, yep. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I loved feeding yeah. him at four o'clock because it meant, I don't know what it was, but I don't know whether it was him feeding or whatever, but I was sitting in the chair with something on TV and my ex-partner would come home and he would find both me and the baby asleep sitting with the tv on <laughs> because like i was just so exhausted like you would just i just yeah. you know my child would be asleep and my child would sleep then for like two three four hours on me but if you put him down in a oh, in wow. a cot or something like that half an hour 45 minutes that was it and then he was like no i want mm-hmm. my mum, please it's just like exhausting yeah but yes but it's not about me mm-hmm. um okay so you just took really small small baby steps then and basically mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't, because I would go, well, okay, that's fine. You're going and getting help. And, they would, you know, I, I, it didn't compute with me that it would be very slow for you because it is. So, because anxiety is that you're going again, like, although it's normal to put your children to bed and leave them and go and do what you need to go and do for an hour or whatever, right? To you, it wasn't normal, was it? It was like, it yeah. was like... It was painful. I didn't want to yeah, leave. It was unbelievable. But I knew I had yeah. to. And the more that I did it, you know, the less my anxiety became and then I would feel a little bit better and I wouldn't feel as 
angry or resentful and I would start to see the benefit of it in it. And I do the same thing with my clients now, because most oftentimes when someone has like a really severe mental health diagnosis, they're not taking care of themselves. So to give, to give them a goal, like, Oh, you're going to take up a new hobby or you're going to start exercising. It's kind of ridiculous when they're not even meeting the basics, like showering, eating, sleeping. Those are the basics, right? So I had to get all those things in order. And then, you know, even that took almost a year. It was only in 2021. Yeah. It was only at the end of 2021 where I started like really exercising again like and then going to yoga again and seeing my friends routinely. And of course, then I was back to work. So that helped too, because it was just a, it was another shift and it made it easier for me to be away from the girls for a longer period of time. Wow. But to give someone a goal when they're not even meeting their basic yeah. needs is just, you know, a little yeah, bit too far. Yeah. And so so would you say that first initial move to going and seeing us we call them over here psychs, but psychologists or whatever, was like the best thing that you mm-hmm. could have done? Do you just you searched it and Googled it, did you, and do it from that perspective? I did, yeah. So I yeah. found it myself. <laughs> and yeah, because I really needed to have a space to talk about how awful my birth experience was for me Yeah, because I would make comments about it sometimes and even to my friends and I know they meant well, but what they would say was, well, at least they're healthy. Right. Like, and that to me was just so dismissive because I was like, so if, if I'm sad about how they were born, that therefore means that I'm not grateful they're healthy. Mm. Like, no, it can be both. I can be grateful that they're healthy and still be really upset that I had a C-section and didn't get to see them and didn't get skin on skin. Like, and all those things that were taken away from me. Every time I went to go feed my children, I had to be hooked up to to the monitor because they had monitors all over them. So I couldn't even like get up and walk with the girls in the NICU. I was stuck to all the wires they were hooked up to. Yeah. Or I, you know, I couldn't even pick up Madison right away because she had her breathing apparatus on and you know, she was so tiny. They were four pounds and I still couldn't see her face for for days because the mask took up her whole face. I'm like, what does my child even look like? So I just needed somebody to say like, yeah, that is valid. You can feel sad about that and, and really like relive the whole experience, which is, which is what you do in therapy. You know, you talk about it. And you were like angry and frustrated. Um, and, well, frustrated, maybe not the word, but angry and annoyed about it because you, what you wanted the girls naturally, you wanted to have them naturally and do all that sort of side of things. Were you aware that you could have yeah. them naturally or what did well, it always I knew that I would probably have a C-section okay. because of just the way that they were positioned and everything. And it wasn't even just the C-section. It was like all the postnatal care. Like everybody was just so dismissive. I had unmanaged pain. Uh, you know, I didn't see the lactation consultant right away, which then affected my milk supply. So then I was pumping. So if I did manage to put the girls down for a minute, I was hooked up to my pump for 45 minutes. And, you know, it was just hard and adjusting, adjusting to life at home. Once I got home was something else I didn't expect because for anyone who's listening, that's a step parent, you know, you grieve an expectation of a life with that as well. You know, I I had an idea of coming home and having my partner with me, but unfortunately my partner has a parenting agreement. That's a legal document that he needs to abide to. So he has things that he has to do with his boys, which would take him away from the house when I would have preferred him to be home. And that's not his fault. That was just the reality of my situation. Yeah, no. And look, I I understand completely what you're saying about the C-section side of things, because I was I was an old, pregnant old hen, really. And, um, you know, I had my son when I was 44, right? And so everyone was in a bit of a panic. And I was the most, I was the most relaxed and chilled out, like 44 year old. I was like, well, this is good. Like, I'm pregnant. It's like a miracle. Happy days. And uh, everyone's like, oh, no, because of your age and like, we need to monitor you. And, And like, and naively, I suppose, I didn't realize, I was like, I'll be all right. Every year, she's all right as such. Yeah, and I, you know, there are, you know, there, there is so much that can happen when you're having a baby. But I was a little bit like you. I was like, well, 
I'm only ever going to get one chance. This is my chance to have a child. And you've just robbed me of having a child naturally because you've just put me through an emergency Mm -hmm. C-section, which I didn't want to have. And I delayed and delayed Mm -hmm. and delayed till there was no point of like, I had to have it because it would have like, you know, affected. And I agree Mm -hmm. with you wholeheartedly. And and I even told myself, um, I was so angry and so frustrated with the whole system of the post natal um care as such because i was felt a little bit like right you had the baby that's all good mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. fine see ya bye it's all good now and i'm like whoa, whoa, whoa what happens now and so i was like hang on a minute like yeah. what goes on yeah. like you know and there's i was overwhelmed with the amount of information oh. and also i had people telling me one thing and other people telling me another thing and i'm like oh my god you know it just couldn't breathe from all of the information that was there and it was just too much too much for me but I was angry and annoyed Mm -hmm. about the c-section and angry and annoyed at people who said to me oh but at least he's healthy he came out all healthy you want a healthy baby don't Mm -hmm. you and I'm like now I tell myself well yeah he is and he's okay and everything's fine but but then I was like oh my god but this is my only chance right you guys who are saying this are going to get other chances I'm not going to get another chance I wanted him to there were so many advantages to actually giving to giving birth to him normally not through a c-section with you know microbiome and all of that stuff and you've taken that away from me i was like what mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. so yeah i was really angry about all of that but yeah so i, I get exactly what you're saying i don't yeah. know if anyone else listening to this understands what we're saying too because it's c-section for me some people elect to have a c-section and and i'm all good for, for that sure. like my view is it's your choice it's okay and that's the piece of it, right? Is that it wasn't, it wasn't a choice. And I know that there were medical reasons for that. However, I can still be upset about it, right? Did you, and, do you think that contributed to the PPD, PPA? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really do. Just the way that it, I mean, there were so many things, honestly, that just the way that it went down, but even just that skin to skin time is so important for the mom to help her hormones yeah. regulate and to help your milk come in. And I never got that. I didn't get it for almost 24 hours. Um, but even the bedside manner, you know, some of the stuff, which I was like, I rate about at first. Now I kind of laugh about it, but yeah. I remember you know, the the doctor just being kind of like, your kids are beautiful and like walking away, but was so flat. I'm like, okay, are they? I don't even know what the fuck they look like, but okay. And then one of the nurses being like, oh my God, your placenta looked like garbage. It's like, I don't even know why you're saying these things to me right now. I'm like strapped on this table, right? You're strapped down naked as a jaybird and you're commenting on my placenta. (laughs) It's like, I don't understand what's going through your mind right now. (laughs) I know, I know. Oh. Sorry, I've got a dry bit in my throat. Okay, so look, what advice would you actually give somebody who has is going through this, like, or yeah. who believes? Let's put it this way: Do you think you can go through PPD, PPA, and not actually have, not be aware that you're actually suffering from this? Yeah, totally. Because I really do think that society like puts this pressure on women to just be okay. And so we like push aside our emotions and push aside our emotions. And we're kind of taught to pour into everybody else. And we are taught that you should just be happy that your baby's here, no matter how it came about and that our feelings aren't really valid on our birthing experience. And so I've had friends who, after I've talked about my experience, have then come out and they're like, oh my, oh my God, like I obviously had postpartum depression and I just thought it was normal, even though I was like that for a year. I'm like, no, that's not normal. It's not normal to be like that for a year. And so my advice to the clients that I work with now or to people who are listening is that you have to treat yourself almost the same way you're treating your newborn. You know, that love and care and compassion, you have to give it to yourself. We need rest. We need to eat. We need a calming, comforting space. We've just given birth, whether it's, you know, vaginally or with a C-section, it's a huge undertaking of your body. And we don't even give our times the space. I mean, look at how fast they discharge you from hospital yeah. to even heal. Well, yeah, I mean, I was lucky. I mean, I, because of my age and also because I could afford it, I went private because I thought, well, I'm 44, so I'm a little bit old, you know, like I'm really old <laughs> compared with anyone else who's doing this, <laughs> right? So, you know, miracle baby, all good. But I thought, right, I, I can afford it. So let's, and I'm not like, 
a multi-millionaire or anything like I just saved up the money so I had money saved that I could afford to actually Mm -hmm. you know go down that avenue in fact I wish I'd actually gone public because the service that the people got public was a lot better than the private service I got and in fact the reason that most people go private over in Australia and a private and just and to say like I mean I don't know what it's like in Canada or the states or wherever but private here in Australia a lot of people like everyday people who are like working in offices and stuff like that have private health and health cover right because there's uh, benefits from the government so that's so it's not as though Mm -hmm. we're like you know earning lots of money and all of that stuff but like there is a certain threshold that we have in Australia which means that you can have private health care it's an advantage to have private health care so are we so what are the signs so if people are listening to this right and they're like your mm-hmm. friends, right, who gave birth and didn't realise and thought it was normal. What What is mm-hmm. normal and what isn't normal? Like what are the signs to actually say? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you were lucky because – well, lucky, not lucky, but, like, you sort of knew, well, this isn't normal, right? Yeah. But, like, some people may not know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just wondering if they're sitting here listening to this going, well, I don't know what that even looks like. I'm, I just think this is what – life is like yeah when you've got kids. Yeah. so what is yeah. normal and what isn't yeah so you know it absolutely is normal to have like a bit of a roller coaster of emotions after you give birth and so if someone's crying you know kind of at the drop of a hat for a couple of days that is normal anything longer than two weeks it should start to lift like it really should oh, and so okay. Um, in terms of the anxiety, you know, that can look different for lots of people. It can feel just like a overwhelming sense of panic. Sometimes it's a detachment from their baby. I didn't have that. I was more yeah. like fixated on my babies, but that still is not that normal to be so rigid about keeping eyes on them all the time. I also had intrusive thoughts, which aren't normal. So um, we have a banister upstairs up that goes down our hallway and then you can kind of look over down to the bottom floor. And I used to always like hug the wall away from the banister because I just was so terrified that I would drop the baby over the banister. Over the banister. It's almost like you're imagining dropping the baby over uh, the banister sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or when they were sleeping, you know, I would imagine them smothering themselves to death or doing things like that. And so intrusive thoughts um, are meant to be a protective measure because it's your brain saying, Hey, this could happen. But when they start to impede your functioning. So for me, I just wouldn't, I didn't ever want to go to the nursery so that I would ask my husband like bring the diapers out to the living room and he's like we'll just go to the nursery I'm like I can't walk past the banister because I was so anxious about potentially dropping the baby over the railing yeah that's when it becomes not normal when it's impacting your functioning right so okay you know my shower was on the other side of the banister so I wasn't showering I wasn't changing my clothes wasn't eating or taking care of myself so if your symptoms are that bad that you're neglecting your your own self-care I would say that it's time to reach out for help and and reach out by like basically going and speaking to someone getting cancelled and going and speaking to a psychologist as such and trying to get somebody to support you because yeah. can you do this on your own I mean I would hope that you wouldn't have to because it's a very lo- lonely journey to do it on your own and I know for me you know what helped the most was creating a community of connection so once I felt comfortable to talk about it I did join twin mom groups and I did open up about my journey and then so many other women said oh my god I had that too and then I felt less alone and less crazy because of course when mm. you're going through it you think I'm a bad mother I'm the only one this happens to but I have talked to hundreds, thousands, probably thousands of women who have had postpartum depression. And I just want to remove the stereotype from it or the stigma from it because it can happen to anybody. I never thought it would happen to me. I thought I had everything in place to prevent it, but you know, it's a huge hormonal imbalance. And for me, you know, I I lost a lot of blood during birth that impacts it. I wasn't sleeping that impacts it. I didn't get that connection time that impacts it. Like there's so many things that were missed for me. And I would hope that women would feel comfortable talking to their OBGYN about it. But if they don't take you seriously, like keep pushing. Cause I didn't, you know, at that point I felt so defeated because it's hard to fight when people don't believe you. Well, and also you're going through so much yourself. So like it is difficult to keep pushing. Like maybe if, you know if you're in a different mindset and you know you weren't going through this you would be pushing but 
mm-hmm. because you're going through this. It's insane, you know, like it's, yeah, you know, it's hard. Yeah, that's really hard. How do we change things so that we make it easier for mums who are dealing with this? Because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, there were elements for me similar but not to the level mm-hmm. that you um, were going through. And I had of it, I had, I had other factors um, dealing with an ex-partner who, um, you know, had his own issues and things like that, as well as a newborn, mm-hmm. as well as, you know, no family, um, no family near me. And also um, the only people who I really knew who had children were not my friends. I'm like one of the first, well, I'm 44 for now crikey's sake okay so a lot of my friends are like a lot younger than me <laughs> and so they didn't have children either so they weren't un- they didn't understand and god love her my friend sharon is my savior and godsend because she would phone me she doesn't have any kids right none whatsoever right mm-hmm. but she would phone me like without fail every week how's it going this week how's it and she would just listen to me offload for an hour on the phone tears yeah. everything and then she'd go okay all right that's cool and you know trying to give, impart some advice and like she kept me saying she kept me not walking in front of those trucks yeah. do you know what I mean that's sort of like yeah and yeah. And, and and you yeah. know and yeah, I mean, you know, um, well, we've had drunken conversations about how much that meant to me and stuff like that. But like, yeah, but it, like, if you haven't got anyone like that, you do really need to go and get support, don't you? And just yeah, and 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 create that community because I really felt like, well, I can just handle this. You know, I should, I should be able to handle it. But we're not meant to handle it alone. You know, women aren't meant to raise children alone. We're meant to be part of a community and to support one another. And if we're going to change things and remove this stigma around like our postpartum journey, like we as women ourselves need to reduce some of the expectations that we have for ourselves, you know, like bouncing back to our pre-baby body or like keeping the immaculate house or taking the Pinterest worthy photos or, you know, whatever. It's like your postpartum journey is yours. And you should, all you should be caring about is if you're sleeping and the baby's sleeping and you're fed and the baby's fed and that's it. Like everything else is not important because when we have the flu, like think about how we honor our bodies and take care of ourselves when we have the flu. When we have a baby, we're like, oh, I should be up and I should be doing this and I should be entertaining, you know, people that come over to visit. I remember my in-laws coming over to visit and asking me if I was going to make coffee. I was like, are you going to fucking make coffee? Like, I, I, like, hello. Like, oh, so it's like, no, like this is our time to heal yeah. and take care of ourselves. This is not our time to be pouring into anybody else except yeah. our child. Yeah. Look, I, yeah. And it is, it's exactly what you say. Me first, me second, me third. It is about, yeah, it yeah. is. And society doesn't. And also I think like, I think it's also like a lot of women go, oh, I'm not breastfeeding because I couldn't stick with it or, I, you know, I had issues or I had one friend who had something like um, something that you get when you breastfeed. Yeah, like something like that. Yeah, 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 like infections. Or, yeah. And so she couldn't breastfeed because she had infections and she felt, felt such a failure, right? And you sit there and go, no, hang on a minute. No, no, no. You don't feel a failure. Mm-hmm. Baby's healthy. You're healthy. I know that, you know, medical people say, oh, it's the best thing to do X, Y, and Z. But you did it for a couple of weeks. It's okay. It's just, You can do it for as long. Like we should give ourselves a break, right, about what we're doing because it just yeah. adds to all of that, yeah. you know. And um, oh, and your absolutely. girls are okay absolutely. now. They're like, your girls are fine. They're, They're probably great. full of energy They're and perfect. full of crazy. You would never know when they were born premature. So they're two and they wear six year old. Oh clothing. my God. Like they are huge. I mean, yeah. I'm tall, so they're, they're going to be tall. I'm five yeah. nine. So yeah, they're so tall for their age. Like they've blown everything off the chart yeah. for their growth and development. Yeah. So they're great. So, but yeah. that's just hats off to you and your <laughs> husband because you're like, just brought them up and you also recognize that you needed to do something, which I think is recognizing mm-hmm. that there is something wrong is I think the first step in anything and then going mm-hmm. and actually, mm-hmm. you know, going and doing that. So, look, um, if people who are listening to this want to get in contact mm-hmm. with you because, they, you know, they want to ask you some questions or they want some advice or whatever, I mean, they can come through myself, but is there any way that they can actually get in contact with you online? Is there any 
sort of do you have a yeah. website or anything like that I do. Yeah. So they can contact me through my website, which is make a McLaren coaching.com. Cool. You can find me on Instagram and on Facebook. I love being on Instagram. I love giving like a really real look into my life. So I talk about all the messes that are oh going gosh, on and how great. I kind of deal with it and just you know, I want people to feel like they're not the only ones that are feeding their kids cereal for dinner. I do it all the time and it's okay. And that's because it works for me and my kids, my kids freaking love it. And it gives me a break. So yeah, you can, you can talk to me on Instagram if you feel so inclined. <laughs> no, I got, no I, I, God love you. Cause that's the reason I started this podcast was to go, Hey, mm -hmm. do you know what? Instagram is like, Instagram is for real people. All right. Not fake people, you know, Facebook, it's like full yeah. on, like, crazy yeah. I mean mine had a meltdown this morning because he didn't want to put socks on or he didn't want to change mm -hmm. his socks he had blue socks on and needs black ones for school and he had a meltdown this morning yeah, he's six. So, so you know you I know your girls are two and like I have to say that doesn't change it doesn't get any better when they get older but just gets different yeah. no that's cool that's awesome so thank you thanks um so that people can get in contact with you uh, now you are in Canada so just to make that very clear but um, yeah. if somebody <laughs> wants to ask you a question or something like that then you know they can um if they're in Australia um then you know um and they want um advice or information on Australian what they can do with us you know where they can go in Australia then I'm more than happy to help so that's cool mm -hmm. so look I have one last question Megan okay. one last question <laughs> big question but I'm sure you can cope with it um I ask it to everyone it's if you had a superpower a superpower what would it be Oh my gosh. Yeah, you yeah. know, superpower. If I had a superpower, I think I would fly. Oh, see. see how much time I spend driving everywhere? Oh, like, good yeah. God. Yeah, well, Canada is just as yeah. big as Australia, if not bigger. I mean, I don't know. I've never been great at geography. But yeah, so I completely agree. And yeah, and like, well, we wouldn't have to get in a plane, which means we wouldn't have to deal with this COVID malarkey, as you like fully aware yeah. of. Um. Mm -hmm. No, what would you do with the girls though? Would you strap? Would you have little like buggy things that you could strap to you to, or would you just bugger oh off my and go yeah, with have... your dad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a like great that. idea. Oh, I'm just gonna go see my friend in oh gonna... Australia. I'll see here. you later. Bye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I see totally you... support yeah. that. Oh, well, so, there we go. Solo mom vacation. Yeah. <laughs> I have to ask though. I have to ask if you're flying. Would you have a cape or no cape? Maybe this is my next new question, right? Cape or no cape if you were a superhero? Like if you were a superhero, cape or no cape? I think I'd have no cape. Yes. I think yeah. no cape too. Like, I don't, I this don't is my need big debate. The, well, it's like you're a superhero, right? You don't want yeah. to be giving the villains an extra thing to be able to yank you back to strangle you with. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. So I'm thinking, look, you can wear your wellies or your boots, and you can wear your underpants on the outside of your blooming trousers if you must, but no cape, no cape. Yeah. It's a big no-no for me. Yeah, I mean, honestly, my superhero outfit would literally be like spandex, an oversized T-shirt, and my greasy hair. So it's like, it's not going to be anything special, but it gets the job done. Okay? Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. That's it. Yeah, no, I would probably go with that as well. It's comfortable and functional. That's what exactly. we have, isn't it? It's mother uniform. It's a mum's uniform. That's all right. Yeah. We even have people go up to the shoot... <laughs> this sounds so bad we have people go to the supermarkets in do you know what uggy boots are yeah yeah they're like because uggy boots well i think uggy boots came from australia but hey australian yeah i'm english yeah. so i don't know where they come from but yeah uh uggy boots so they go in the winter and it's not really winter here in australia well i'm in melbourne so it is they go to the blooming supermarket like four five o'clock six o'clock they'll be in uggy boots and jammy bottoms we should like tracky <laughs> bottoms and a t-shirt and they'll go yeah. up to the supermarket to go and get dinner. So it's like, eh. so yeah, God love, God love Australia. That's why I'm here. <laughs> um, no, that's cool. Look, thank you so much. I would let you get on cause it's evening where you are. It's daytime for me, it is. but it's yeah. evening where you are. So, um, yeah, look, thank you. Thanks for telling us about thank you. I so appreciate you having through. me. No, yeah. So you're like, it's, I, there has to be a lot more done and I'm, I, you know, and I know there's a lot being done, but I think it has to, we have to give ourselves a break after our yeah. kids are born. We have to give ourselves a break 
Um, mm-hmm. And we have to be aware of these signs because it can mm-hmm. be like it can be dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really important that people get help and talk to somebody or that if you've got a friend who you think mm, something's not quite right with them because that's not what they're really like. Start, mm-hmm. you know, help them talk say to them. something. Yeah. Say, say something, something to somebody yeah. and, you know, help them. But no, brilliant. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will let you get on with your day, your evening. I will let you go to bed. I don't know. What time is it there? It's 8 o'clock here on Thursday. Oh, see, it's Friday Happy here. from the past, yeah. Friday lunchtime, yeah, I know. <laughs> Friday lunchtime. Like, you've got a whole another morning to go through. It's oh. like, what the? Um, <laughs> mind you, I get to the weekend before you, so hey. I know. Um, yeah, no, so I would let you go. Thank you so much. And, yeah, have a great evening and have a great – well, I'm going to have a great weekend. You've got a date. Yeah, you have a great weekend. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. See you later. See you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. If you'd like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family on all the usual social media platforms that you're normally on. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content that I know you're going to want to hear like this. If you want to check out past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast or for links, resources and show notes, go to our website www.strongsingleandhuman.com. We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey, and Twitter. Have a wonderful week, and I hope to see you back here again soon. Be kind to yourself, and remember, no one's perfect, and we're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin, and you've been listening to the Strong, Single, and Human podcast.